today. Numbers chapter 11. All right. This is a major transition in our journey as we are watching the children of Israel as they have moved out of Egypt. They went to Sinai. They talked to the Lord. They got the, the, uh, the instructions and the laws and all of the uh, information on how to build the tabernacle. They got the information on how to offer up all the sacrifices and all of the offerings. And now they're ready to travel. All right. And you remember on last week when, when we were looking at as they were beginning to travel and uh, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, he said, well, I'm going to go back to my folks now. Y'all go ahead and y'all have a nice trip. And what did Moses say? Moses said, no, don't leave us. Because you know about this area and you know about this, uh, this wilderness. And, uh, you know, we could use your, your, your skill. And we kind of pointed out that we can understand why Moses might say that. But who should Moses be leaning on? He should be leaning on the Lord. And one of the wonderful things about allowing Jethro to go is that Jethro could take what he knew and what he had discovered about the Lord back home to his own people. And that's how a lot of times the Lord's information travels. So we kind of talked a little bit about that. So now we're going to pick up from that point because once again, they're starting to make that move. And let's see what happens as they get forward. Let's go ahead and get the reading in. Numbers chapter 11. Let's take a, a listen here. Chapter 11. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons, and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of delium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills, or beat it in a mortar, and baked it in pans and made cakes of it, the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them, that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh, that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them. They shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it come out at your nostrils, and it be loathsome unto you, because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? And Moses said, The people among whom I am are six hundred thousand footmen, and thou hast said, I will give them flesh, that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them, to suffice them? 
Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? The Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people, and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud, and spake unto him, and took of the spirit that was upon him, and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that, when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other Midad. And the spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man, and told Moses, and said, Eldad and Nida do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered, and said, My lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses gat him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. And there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea, and let them fall by the camp, as it were a day's journey on this side, and as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. And the people stood up all that day, and all that night, and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hakaba, because there they buried the people that lusted. And the people journeyed from Kibroth Hakaba unto Haziroth, and abode at Haziroth. All right, so there we go. Now, one of the reasons why I said that this is a very interesting chapter is because this seems to be a snare and a trap that uh, not just the children of Israel fall into, but people in general. Um, and we're going to try to uh, paint this, and, and, and hopefully we'll be able to see what this represents, because We've, we've, we've went through enough of what the Lord did to be able to understand what these words mean. Like, remember when we talked about Egypt, Egypt is a type of what? Sin. Remember we went through the study of manna. What we saw that manna was like how, how the Lord gave his what? His word that fed not just the natural body, but it fed the, the spirit and the soul, <clears throat> which is what his word does. So when we read this, um, we're going to read this and look and see what they're really, really craving. Let's see if we can understand the true nature or the true spirit behind what's going on here. Because we, one thing we do know, we do know the enemies behind this. And when we went through our, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, some of you might not have been there, but when we went through our merged gospel, when we looked at all the gospels put together and followed it as one story, we saw a continuous theme, and that was that the multitude or the crowd followed. And, and I always tried to point out, when the crowd was following Jesus, don't always assume that that's a good thing. A lot of times, people follow Jesus for their own purposes and their own reasons. Not everybody that follows Jesus wants to be uh, in line with what Jesus was teaching. And we tried to point that out. So I'm going to bring that back in today as well. When we deal with, uh, uh, when you got people that are following right now, that they're following the Lord the, uh, uh, as he manifests himself as that pillar of cloud in the day and the pillar of fire at night. And when that pillar moves, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to move. All right. So now everybody that's following them is following them for their particular reason. Are you following the Lord because he's the Lord? Or are you following the Lord because you can possibly get your bellies full? Remember what Jesus said when he fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. He said, you guys are not following me because I teach good or I'm telling you the truth. You're following because you got your bellies full. So there's something about that connection that we're going to try to make with people getting their bellies full and them trying to find out uh, am I following God for my own purposes or following God for what God can do? So let's look at it. Let's go into it. I, I, it's just a quick overview. 
Look at verse 1 here in chapter 11. It says, and. Now, the important thing about and is a what? It's a connective word. So that means we got to connect what we're about to read with what we've already read before. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to connect this particular chapter to, to, to the last chapter and the chapters that we've already read. And we're going to pull from them. Okay? So it says, and when the people complained. Wait a minute. What? You complaining already? You're not satisfied? You already have an issue. Okay. So why does complaining happen? Complaining happened because your expectations are not met. What you expect to happen is not happening. It's a clear sign when, when you have uh, complaining that you are not in agreement with what is currently happening. And so that's what we're going to be uh, analyzing here in, uh, 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 in Numbers chapter 11. This whole uh, point of view of what you want. And that's what complaining, hap- uh, complaining uh, goes. Now, who's leading them? The Lord. All right? And the Lord is leading them, and he's using Moses as a, uh, a, a, a emissary between him, him and the people, and he's telling them when to go and when to go, and, w- and when to stop, when to camp and when to walk, what to build and what not to build, how to carry it. He's leading so, if you're complaining, you are not satisfied with what? What God is doing. So, already, there's a complaint. All right, so, once again, let's go back. Chapter 11, very first word, and when the people complained. Okay, so they're not happy with what God is doing so far. Look what it says. It displeased the Lord. Of course. Why? Because who are they complaining against? God. He's the one when they when these same people were crying in Egypt, get us out of Egypt. And what what did we say that Egypt was a type of? Egypt is a type of what? Sin. So the people were, were accurately uh asking God, can you get me out of sin? And God did. He got him out. All right. But now a lot of times people don't want to get out of sin. They want to get out of oppression, but I still want to do my thing. I don't want to do God's thing. And so we're going to try to identify that sometimes there's no... It's, your thing will always bring you back to sin. <laughs> and that's what's happening here. Alright, so let's, let's keep going. Let's see if they're complaining will bring them back to sin. Let's see what happens. Verse, verse uh, 1 again. And when the people complain... It displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. All right, so God was displeased, his anger was kindled because they were not happy with what God is doing, and they're complaining about it. All right, was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the camp, in the uttermost part of the camp. All right, so. The complaining of what God is doing, I don't like what I see God doing, and I don't like what God, where God is leading us. That was their initial complaint. And the Lord sent burning fires around the camp and began to consume those that were uh, in the forefront of the complaint. Now, did, did it consume them to death? Did it consume their property? Did, well, I'm not 100% sure about that word, but there was some loss. Okay? So, your complaining will bring you what? Loss. You will lose something that God has already given you when you're complaining about what God gives you. See, when you're complaining about what God gives you, God's saying, okay, well, you don't like what I'm giving you, and he will do what? He will take it back. See, one thing that we, we, we vastly under, underestimate is the ability for God to give you what you ask for. And he's going to give you exactly what you ask for. Now, uh, I work with computers, and um, computers are extremely logical. I don't care what you think you did. 
the computer will only react to what you actually did. No matter what you thought you did, what you meant to do, what you were uh, uh, trying to accomplish, the computer is only going to do what you said. So when you make your password on your computer, you know, capital one, two, three, four, five, and you go in there and you, and you, uh, and you type in, you know, something different, I don't care what you thought you typed in. It's only going to react to what you did. Now, now, I'm not saying God is unfeeling and un, un, God does know intention. That's something different than the computer. God does know uh, motive and he knows uh, um, uh, desires and all of that better than we do. But one thing he does know is he knows why you do what you do. He doesn't have to guess and he will give you what you want, what you want deep. And sometimes people don't want the things of God. And what you don't realize is when you get taken away that which you think you don't want, you begin to miss it. And you begin to feel it as loss. And that's what happens here. So there's a consumption that's taking place. Let's keep going. Verse 2. And the people cried unto Moses. Now the people went straight to Moses. They went straight to, to Moses who was, who was God's representation. And he's also the representation of the law. So they go right to Moses. And when Moses prayed unto God, Moses did what he was supposed to do. He goes right to God. He prayed unto the Lord. Uh, the fire was quenched. So the people went to Moses. Moses prayed. And the consumption stopped. Okay. So now uh, they're at that point where, okay, we've had some loss. But the fire has now been quenched. Let's keep going. Verse 3. And he called the name of that place uh, Taborah because the fire of the Lord burned among them. So they memorialized that. And that's an important thing to do. Keep in mind, when we complained, this is what happened. Okay? Now, you think that that would satisfy. Okay, well, good. All right? Uh, Penny has a question. Go ahead. I think what uh, is need to be added is that we might, God knows what we want, but we don't want to give in to what it takes to get what we want. Mm. And that's where the complaining comes in. We just want what we want, but we don't want to uh, do what it takes to get what we want. Okay, that's and better. that means that sometimes some fire needs to be burnt up in you. Some attitude needs to be changed. Mm. You, we don't want none of that. All right, that's true. That's true. Sometimes what, what Penny is saying, we, we, the Lord knows what we want. But he also knows in order for you to get that, you're going to have to let go some other some things, and that needs to be, be burnt out. Uh, and we don't want that. So a lot of times we don't want the process. We don't want the, the change and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the manifestation that has to take place to get what it is that we want. All right, but let's keep going. Let's keep going. That's true, too. But remember, we're dealing with, well, we're going to be, uh, let's look at this next uh, verse here, and we're going to talk about what we're dealing with. Look at this next verse. It says, and the mixed multitude. Oh, remember we talked about them? <laughs> the mixed multitude. All right. We're going to be talking a lot about them here uh, going forward. The mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. All right. Uh, well, let me read the rest of it. And the children of Israel also uh, wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? All right. So where are they now? And they're complaining. So this mixed multitude. Now, we talked about this mixed multitude. Remember when they left Egypt? Some of the people that left Egypt were not all. Let me just rephrase that. Not all of the people that left Egypt were direct, pure descendants from Abraham Isaac and Jacob. Some of them were a, 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 a conglomeration of Egyptians that saw that the God of the Israelites was more powerful than the God of the Egyptians. And so they decided, I'm going to follow the most powerful God. Now, are they following God? Those that, I mean, say, those that have that attitude, are they following God because they love God and want to know God? No. no, they're following God because he seems to be the winner. You know, if you can't beat him, join him, so to speak. And so that's why they're following. And so they're, they're doing it to, for their, their own personal benefit. The Egyptians God I thought was great. This Israelite God, 
they're greater, I'm following them. Okay? So you got that kind of uh, 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 situation going on. Some of it was mixed because you had Egyptian uh, 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 men that married the, the Hebrew women and vice versa. Some of the Hebrew women married the Egyptian. Uh, the Hebrew men married the Egyptian women. So you got this mixed multitude for all kinds of reasons and all kinds of purposes, and they got all kinds of agendas all in the mix. And so the mixed multitude says they fell a lusting. All right, now, what are they lusting for? All right, you generally, all lust comes from the desires of the flesh. And we want to highlight that. You, we, where you see that lusting, especially in this chapter, it's about the flesh. What does the flesh want? All right? And we know the flesh can desire all kinds of things. From It's, 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 it's a desire for uh, uh, importance. It's desire for pride. It's desire for uh, uh, feeling all kinds of uh, emotional Sex. and, 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 and uh, uh, uplifting things all the way down to the base levels of just lusting for sexual gratification. I mean, so there's a whole uh, a myriad, a rainbow of flavors that the, that the flesh can want. Okay? Let's keep going. Okay? So, uh, it says, who shall give us, what? Flesh to eat. So, the, the, the lust nature comes from the desires of the flesh. And it's ironic and kind of funny that what do they want? I want flesh. The flesh in us lusts, but it's kind of funny how the word of God points out that the thing they're lusting for is, is it, what we call it, we call it gluttony, right? They're not satisfied with what they, they have to eat. And so they want, they want flesh to eat. In other words, I want some chicken, some pork chop, some turkey meat, you know. I want some hamburgers and hot dogs. They want flesh. Okay. Well, what were they eating prior to? Manna. We're going to get to that in just a minute. All right. So they want the flesh. They want something that was once dead, once alive, that had to what? Be died, that had to die. And that's what I want to eat. So I want to eat something that was once alive, but is now dead. So you look at that whole concept of what we're chasing. You're chasing things that, that, uh, that, from a metaphorical standpoint, have no life. But you're following the God that is the God of life. And you're complaining about what he's doing. And wanting something that was alive but is now dead. So you see the metaphorical aspect. You see the typological concepts that you can read into this. Okay? Let's keep going. Verse 5. We remember the fish. All right, so, so now, look at their list. They want to eat what? Flesh. But look at their list. We remember the fish, okay? Fish is, you know, you can, you can categorize that as flesh. But, but what else do they, 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 they think of? Uh, which we did eat in where? In Egypt. So we remember the, the flesh we had when we were in Egypt. Now, Egypt is a type of what? Sin. Read the verse with the metaphorical meaning. Okay? We remember the fish or the flesh which we did eat in sin. Because that's what Egypt stands for. So if you read, if you substitute the word Egypt with the word sin, look what it look how it sounds. And I do this so that you can see how it looks in the spirit. This is what your spirit is craving. I want fleshly stuff that's that's, that's developed and made in sin. In Egypt. Right? But then they go on. It ain't just the flesh they want. They want Egypt. Because look what else they say. We, we ate freely. The cucumbers, that's not flesh. The melons, that's not flesh. <clears throat> the leeks and the onions and the garlic. All these are condiments. These are not fleshly things. But they remember it in where? In Egypt. Egypt. So I want the fleshly fish from Egypt. I also want the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. They really just want the stuff that was in where? In Egypt. That we got freely. Now, and what does freely mean? I got to do what I wanted to do. Which, if you actually think about it, is a lie. <laughs> because when they were in Egypt, they were in what? 
Slaves. Slavery. Mm-hmm. But uh, see, that's what sin can do. Sin can mm-hmm. make you think you missing out. Mm-hmm. Remember how wonderful it was? Mm-hmm. And it's are there some pleasures? Yes. Moses said, I'd rather live with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. But that was Moses. The rest of the people were where? In slavery. And that's what sin will do. It will put you in slavery even if you don't recognize it. And what Moses recognized was even though I was a a leader in Egypt, I was still a slave. Mm -hmm. Moses saw that. And that's why he left. There's slavery in every level of life. You're slave to something. Mm -hmm. That's right. So Penny said there's slavery in every level of life if you're following it you're slave to something and you gotta yeah, it starts right here yep it sure does it starts right in the mind all right well let's keep going here there's a lot in this <clears throat> and um that's why i said this is a very very interesting chapter because it speaks a lot to our our, our actually our, our, our soulless nature of what we're actually craving for from the spiritual standpoint look at look at verse <clears throat> verse six this is so important he says but now our soul is dried away I think that's really interesting because they mentioned the word soul. My soul is dry, dry, uh, dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Wow. Look at, let's read verse 7. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof was the color of, of bedellium. Or it, was a, it was kind of a pale greenish color. All right, let's, t- let's deal with this. So they said, our soul is dried up because there's nothing to eat besides this manna. Now, that's a problem. Okay, now we gotta we gotta dig into this. Because when we went through the study of manna, remember when the people of Israel were talking about how they didn't have anything to eat, and the Lord says, I will provide for you in the wilderness. And he's and he said, When you wake up, you're gonna have something to eat. And they woke up and they found manna all over the place. And they just went out, and and God said, now listen, this is food directly from me. I'm feeding you. So trust me that I will feed you every day. Don't take more than what you you can eat in a day. And, of course, some of them didn't. They went out, and they got more manna than what they can eat in a day. And what happened the next day when they tried to store it? It turned to worms. But the key here was that God says, I will give you the food you need. And we, we, we said, well, how does that uh, break down in its metaphorical aspects? The manna was like God's food. And remember when Jesus was at the well, uh, the, at the woman at the well, and uh, the uh, disciples went out to get him food. And when, he came, when they came back, They saw that he was not famished or or looking hungry. And they said, did did you have anything to eat? And he said, I have food to eat that you what? No, not not of. I'm eating from the things of God. I'm eating from the the, the word of God. And we we, we represent the manna as being a type. God will feed you what will nourish your soul, not just the body. It will nourish the soul. And then that from nourishing the soul, will rejuvenate the body. Okay? So, what are they saying? Let's read it again, and let's look at the the, the aspects of it. Let's put, remember, word is like the word, man is like the word of God. Now, let's read it like that. Our soul is dried up. There's nothing at all besides this word of God before our eyes. They're tired, they're tired of what God is saying, what God has given. They don't want that manna, the word which feeds you, the, the presence of God. Remember, Jesus said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So that whole rejection of manna is them rejecting God in all of his forms. What he's teaching, all that word that went before them, how to build the tabernacle, how to do the offering, they're tired of all that. And it's, 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 it's culminated and represented in the aspect that they're saying, I'm sick of what God's feeding us. God is feeding us every day and I'm tired of it. Every day I wake up, there's another miracle and I don't want it. I want the natural stuff that I can see that we saw back in Egypt. And that's what I want. 
I don't want this manna. Rejecting of the manna talks about their spirit. It talks about their nature. They don't want God. They want what God can give. And I can't overemphasize how much religiosity is about what I can gain by serving God, not how I can get to know God. There is an en enormous difference in the two. But they look very similar. People that are following God to see what they can get from God look like people that are following God because they love God, because they do the same things. They, go, they read the same Bible. They go to the same meetings because they're trying to they're, and they're, they're talk in the same verbiage. But it's two different perspectives. One wants to know God and the other one wants to get from God. And you got to watch that. I'm in church, Bobby. Huh? I'm in church. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So look at verse 8. It says, uh, and the people went about and gathered it um, and, and ground it in the mills and beat it. This is the manna. And beat it in the mortar and baked it in the pans and made cakes of it. And it tasted, uh, had the taste of, uh, of fresh oil. Um, and verse 9, it says, And when the dew uh, fell upon the camp at night, the manna fell with it. So it's just giving you a, another description of how the manna fell. I also think it found, it's, it's interesting that they describe the manna, the taste of it as what? Fresh oil. What's another manifestation or, or type of oil? Oil represents what? The, Holy Spirit. the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. We're going to see the Spirit of God again here in another type. But when you, when you learn all these different types and then you, when you read the Bible and you put the types in it and you just, just separate the word, and, and, and not separate, uh, substitute the word and see what, what kind of insight it gives you. So when we say here, it talks about how you get fresh oil, the fresh spirit of the Lord is what that manna would give them. All right? The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. <laughs> All right, and they were tasting and seeing, and they were they were tired of it because they were not getting what they wanted. All right, let's keep going. Verse ten. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout uh, the families, every man at his door door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled. Moses also was displeased. All right, so uh, now. God is not happy with the uh, attitude of the people, and Moses is upset. Let's see why Moses is upset. We know why God is upset. Let's see why Moses is upset. Look at 11. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted my, uh, uh, thy servants? Oh. So now Moses is complaining. Let's keep going. And wherefore... Have I not found favor in thy sight that thou hast laid uh, this burden of all this people upon me? All right. We're seeing a theme here. And we're going to see this continuously with Moses. This is one of the problems with being in front. If you're going to lead, if you're going to give people advice and direction. When you begin to think that you're the one that's that, that's doing the real guiding, Moses should recognize that all I am is a reader of the compass. I'm going to look at what God is saying. He says go left. He says go north. He says go southeast. And all I'm going to do is tell you what God's telling you. There's no burden on me unless I want. I let it be. The only thing that I am is to tell you what God. Now, you can get mad at me for telling you what God told me. That's fine. You can shoot the mailman if you want to. But it's not my burden unless I let it be. And that's one of the things that the enemy can get. When you are helping, you got family members, you got children, you got uh, 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 people on your job that you're leading and your guy. Recognize that if you give it to God, you're asking God to give you the, the, the directions. 
right? Now, the people may put all the pressure on you, but where do you, what do you do with the pressure? Take all your cares and do what? You cast them to the Lord because he cares for you. If you don't make that transition, you will get burdened down. So if you get blessed to be in a leadership position, in a directive position, you can't eliminate God from that responsibility. <clears throat> you still have to take all your burdens and you got to cast them to the Lord. Moses was holding on to it. And now when he casts it to the Lord, he's casting it to the Lord with a what? With an attitude and an accusation. He's accusing God. All right, let's keep going. He says, uh, <clears throat> verse 12, I have convinced all this people, uh, I, I have uh, begotten them. He says, have I conceived all these people? Have, am I the one that's begotten? In other words, are they my real responsibility? So what he's trying to do? He's trying to share it all. I don't, I'm not the one that's supposed to do it. Well, you're not, Moses. God is the one that's doing it. But he's seeing it from a bad perspective. All right? Uh, he says, carry them, uh, carry them in my bosom. He says, should I carry them in my bosom? Am I the one that's supposed to feed them? Okay, that's how he's seeing it. As a nursing father, all right, uh, uh, beareth the suckling child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. Am I the one that's got to nurse them all the way to the land of milk and honey? No, Moses. All you got to do is just say what I say. Let it be that simple. But if you want to take it personal, all right, if you want to say, well, I'm the one that's telling you what to do, rather than keep telling them, God told me to tell you. All right? So uh, that's how you want to look at it. All right? And let it go. And let that. it go. Now, now, what Moses is saying, God's telling me to tell you this, and I agree with God, but it's not me. Mm -hmm. But Moses is trying, he's allowing the people to see him as, oh, he's a great leader, or he's a great this, or he's a great that. No, it's all about God. Yeah. Let's keep going. Verse 13. Which should I have flesh to give unto this people? Now, Moses is like, I don't have flesh to give to these people. He's also seeing his inadequacy, which is fine, but he's not the one that's paying the, 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 the people their, their wants and their desires. It's not coming out of his bank account. But right now, that's how he's feeling. And I remember when I started this, I said, you might remember yourself feeling like this. You're feeling the pressure, feeling the burden, feeling, the, feeling overwhelmed because you think it's all about how you're going to fix it. And it's not how you're going to fix it. We got to give it to God and just let God fix it. Well, God, don't, he might not go the way I want him to go. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Well, God might let it hit rock bottom. He might let the whole thing just break. Right. So? So be it. Amen. That's God. That's his business. You got to let it happen. Because there's a lot of things I want to see. And I look and I go, man, this is not going the way I thought it was going to go. And I have to make myself let it go. Because it's, it's not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, there's a ton of things. I'm like, man. And, I, and I, think I, I, I think I know what needs to happen. I feel I do. But I go, you know what? I don't. I, so I just got to let it go. And 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 it may not be the thing that I'm trying to see happen may not be what needs to happen. So I need to change my perspective, my direction, and my aim. Maybe I'm aiming in the wrong way. All that. Your thinking is wrong. Say again? Your thinking is wrong. Thinking can be completely wrong. Mm -hmm. All right. Because every man is right in his own eyes. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. But the Bible says, uh, 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 lean not to your own, own understanding. understanding. Okay. Amen. All right, but let's keep going. Um, where we at? Where do I leave off at? 14. Uh, 14. 14. 14. Mm -hmm. All right. And he says, uh, I am not able to bear all this people alone. You ain't supposed <laughs> So he, he, he is on that track. <laughs> because it is too heavy for me. Of course it is, <laughs> Moses. Because you're not as strong as God. You ain't God. 15. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me. So now Moses is ready to die. He is suicidal because he's trying to do the things that only God can do. Yes. And some of that, some of that thinking and that concept that Moses is doing, um, we can kind of like link to people's 
today time anxieties anxiety and yes. their depression yep. and all that because they're they're in a lane and trying to do things that's not in their realm to do and they're thinking and thinking on these things and and putting them their own self in turmoil that's right um, it's it's a it's a key indicator for anxiety that's mm -hmm. a very good point go ahead hey hey what? And that's us trying to fix it again. Mm -hmm. We can't fix it. Mm -hmm. That's what we got to come to the realization. God is the fixer. Mm -hmm. God is the healer. God is the deliverer. God is the one to get you the job that you want. Mm -hmm. and he learn, said, I will get the desires of your heart. And but learn to wait on God. Get it. Because mm -hmm. yep. if it's for you, God is going to give it to you. That's, that's right. right. And if it's not for you, why do we want it? And I had to tell myself that. If God didn't give it to me, I don't really want it. There you go. Amen. That's yeah, right. you know, you know, that's absolutely right. But you gotta also realize too that, like they say, the rain is a terrible thing to waste. Mm -hmm. And see, once you start thinking, because mm -hmm. everybody's gonna think. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That that's your nature to think. You don't always think right. Mm -hmm. You always have thoughts. Right. Yeah. That's you know. Your thoughts, I mean... That's why we got to be born again. Thoughts, it's the way you place them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, all right. I've had wonderful jobs. You know? And I always thought, all right, that's because of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. But where did I get the knowledge from? Right. Someone had to teach me. Mm -hmm. I didn't just wake up and say, oh, man, I can work on bonds. Mm -hmm. I had to be taught. That's right. So... God put someone in my life to teach me something that I had no knowledge about who was willing to say, you know what, this might be good for you. That's right. That's right. But uh, what a lot of times we put all the responsibility on on me, myself, and, and I. I. Right. And that's going to produce anxiety. Mm -hmm. All right? Let's look at this. Let me read 15 again from the beginning. And if thou... Deal thus with me. This is Moses speaking. Kill me. Moses was, uh, he's suicidal. You can kill me. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Now, he is working in the things of God and he can't handle it. All right? He says, I pray thee out of the, out of the hand, uh, if I have found favor in thy sight and let me not see my wretchedness. So he's seeing I'm out of place. He knows I'm wretched. But can he identify you're wretched because you're trying to become the target for people's desires? The people's desires should be navigated to God. Mm -hmm. So when they want stuff, you can just say, hey, God, they, they're complaining about flesh. What you want me to tell them? Mm -hmm. But he's already trying to figure it out. He's like, well, how are we going to feed all these people? How are we going to do this? You know? And so you know, that's, that's one of his problems. He's trying to, he's trying to do the math. We got 600,000 people. How are we going to give everybody a pork chop? I don't know how to do it, but look at what he says. Let's keep going. Verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, gather unto me 70 uh, men of the elders. Boy, God will give you what you want. This is going to be a problem, though. Of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be uh, the elders of the people and the, office, uh, and the officers over them, and bring them to the tabernacle of the congregation. What do we talk about the tabernacle of the congregation? That is what? Where God speaks and talks. Where God gives direction. Right? So when you bring them to the tabernacle of the congregation, God's going to say something. Right? And that's, he's obviously going to say, so he said, bring them there. All right? That they may stand uh, there with thee. 17. And I will come down and talk. That's what he does at the tabernacle of congregation with thee there, and I will take the spirit which is upon thee. Look at this. He's going to take the spirit which is upon Moses, and I will put it, put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, and thou uh, bear it not thyself alone. Now, this we saw already in the last chapter, didn't we? When Moses was trying to convince Jethro, his father-in-law, don't leave me. I need your what? Your help. Moses was already kind of looking like 
this is becoming a lot of, of a burden for me. And he wanted his father-in-law to stay with him because you know the wilderness. You've been living in the wilderness your whole life. Your, all your people lived in the wilderness. And I need you. He was already beginning to lean on what? Man's intelligence. When who was really leading them? It's God. So now it comes out full-fledged. And God's saying, okay, you, you, you wanted Jethro. And now I'm going and now you're complaining because the people are coming to you when you still feel overwhelmed. I'm gonna take some of your spirit, I'm gonna go into your bank account, take some of your money, and I'm gonna give it to everybody else. I'm gonna give it to 70 people. And you go, well, wait a minute, is that what that means? To a certain degree, from the spiritual perspective, yes. I'm not gonna give you all of the directional information. I'm gonna give some of it to other people. Right? Because you can't handle it. And what, is that, what does that tell you? Some people can't handle a whole lot of money. Some people can't handle a whole lot of power. Some people can't handle a whole lot of responsibility. You see those shows where people hit the, hit the numbers and they become you know, multi-millionaires and they're broke in a, you know, in a year or two? Because the reason they were broke in the first place is the same reason they're broke after they had the money. Okay, don't know what you know what to do and how to do it. Whereas you see some people they just they've been nickel and diamond their whole life, and somehow or another they're able to do things, buy cars, buy houses, put kids through college, you know, and never had a couple of you know several hundred dollars to rub together at the same time. Somehow or another they're able to do it. All right, but and that's good because they can handle it that way. But then when you give them too much, they they're wasting it on all kinds of nonsense. Don't know how to allow stuff to sit and grow. Right, but so Moses he, he, he can't handle all of it. It's too much for him. All right, so now God's going to put it on the seventy. Now let me say something about those seventy. That seventy is eventually going to become the Sanhedrin, that seventy uh, uh, elders, that leaders, the seventy that starts here. This is the the root and the beginning, the seed of the seventy. Guess who is going to try? And put to, in, to, to trial Jesus. Who's the same? The 70, the Sanhedrin. These are the, this is the beginning of the people that are going to sit together in that room at night and put Jesus on trial and find him guilty. The same uh, headship, not the same people, but the same headship, the same titles. This is the organizational aspect that is going to try Jesus, try God, and find him guilty. All right, so I just figured I'd throw that out there as well. Verse 18. Uh, and say unto the people, uh, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. So he's letting them know, you're going to have some flesh. God's going to give you what you, what you want. want. Mm -hmm. And ye shall have, uh, and ye, sh ye shall have wept in your, in the ears of the Lord, saying, uh, who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. God heard that. We were, mm. we were doing well in sin in Egypt. Mm. Therefore, the Lord will give you flesh and ye shall eat. He's going to give you your lust. Mm. Remember, flesh is like lust, right? So you, you, you want it to stay in sin and you want your lust. All right? Verse 19. Ye shall not eat one day. You're not going to be in sin and lust. You're not going to be in Egypt like and flesh for one day, nor two days, nor five days, mm. neither ten days, nor twenty. God's going to give you what you want, and you're not going to, you're going to recognize eventually. Look at this, twenty. But even a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils. Oh, Jesus. Mm. So he's, he's going to let you get so full of what you want that it leaks out your nose. Mm. And it, uh, and it be loathsome unto you. You're going to learn to hate sin. Mm. And this is what God's running. I need, you to, I need you to really get a full taste of what sin is like. You need to begin to hate it. Because thou hast despised the Lord which is among you. You've despised the Lord. He didn't say you despise Moses, and you didn't just despise the manna. You're despising who? The Lord. 
and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? Let's rephrase that. Why came we forth out of sin? Mm -hmm. Because you were not happy in sin. You were miserable and you were enslaved. But they forgot that. They forgot all of that. And that's how we are sometimes. Let's keep reading. 20. And Moses said unto the people um, uh, among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. And thou sayest, I will give them flesh. Now Moses is questioning what God is saying. God said, I'm going to give you flesh and enough you're going to have it for a month and it's going to come out of your nose. And Moses said, well, we got 600,000 footmen. I'm just counting the strong men ready to go to war. Not including the women and the children and the older guys and the younger men and the younger children. How are we going to give everybody flesh to eat? That, 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 that they may uh, uh, eat a whole month. Look at, 20, look at 22. So he's like, how are you going to do this? Look at 22. This is, his Mo, this is what Moses thinks should happen. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to, to sacrifice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to sacrifice them? So Moses is like, how are we going to do this? Do we got to kill all our animals? All our beasts of burden? Well, what is he doing? This is why Moses is feeling the what? The heaviness of the people. Because he's always trying to do the math. And he has to learn. Like I had to learn a long time ago. Stop trying to do the math. Stop looking at what you got and what you ain't got and look at God. Mm -hmm. All right? And then see how that can uh, benefit and help you. All right? Um, look at verse 23. And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? This is what God says to Moses' statement. Is God, is God dealing with short hands? <laughs> Has thou, uh, thou uh, shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And what God is saying. Now, keeping in mind, what have these people seen? These people have seen the, the miracles in Egypt. They've seen all kinds of stuff. All right? Now, I'm looking at my clock. We got two minutes. But you know what? Can I get another? Overtime. I, overtime. I, I can get some overtime? Okay. Overtime. All right. <laughs> Just want to make sure. Overtime. All right, we're gonna do we're gonna do we're gonna do some overtime. All right, all right. So uh, they have seen miracle after miracle. They've been trapped in bad situations before, and God has always brought them out. Now, when they were trapped before, they were enslaved. Another time they were trapped, they were between the Red Sea and the armies of Egypt. What's trapping them now? Their own lusts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where I am, so it's not. The, I, I'm not fighting a battle. I don't feel like I'm gonna be be be, be stabbed, or shot, or drowned. I don't fighting see any. Out. I don't see any immediate danger. All I see is my wants. Yeah. My lusts are consuming me, and so I'm allowing my lusts to weary my mind because all I'm doing is feeding my mind with my lusts. All day long, I'm thinking about, man, in Egypt, I had fish, and I had cucumbers, and I had melons. Yeah, but you're not thinking about, I was getting whipped, and I, I didn't have no clothes. and, and so, you're not, so your mind is thinking about all that, and that's what lust does. See, lust can, see, that's why, you know, um, you look at some of these, uh, these sensual women on TV, and they come out, and they look a certain way, and so all the guys, you know, ooh, if I only had her, if I only had her, if I only had, well, but you don't know who she really is. I mean, she may be crazy as a, as a, as a bat. You'd be like, oh, if I only had her. Yeah, well, well I mean, what you going to do? Will she come out and take a dump in the middle of the living room? Oh, but she, look at how, look at how wonderful she looks. Look, she just as crazy as she can be. But you want only, and you're not seeing the other aspects of it. Well, if I only had that job, if I only had that job, that's all you, if I only had that job, huh? 
Yes, you're just seeing her flesh. That's all you're seeing is the you're flesh. You're not seeing her mind. You're not seeing nothing else. You're not seeing that craziness. You're not seeing <laughs> all of that. And so that's right. what lust does. This is a prime example of lust. Lust will only see one aspect. It will only see the, the, enticing the, the, the skin yeah. of it. It what doesn't do see the do? internal. Right. So you got to get rid of because lust only is looking at the flesh. It's superficial. Right. It's so superficial. All right, but let's keep going. All right, so in verse 24, and Moses went, did I finish 23? Let me see, wax short. Uh, you yes. see whether my words, yes. okay, okay, I finished that. Okay, 24. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. So Moses went out and did what he was supposed to do, tell people what God said, and gathered the 70 of the elders. So the 70 gathered together, and uh, other people, and set them round about the tabernacle. So they're doing what they were supposed to do, 25. And the Lord came in the cloud. All right, remember, that's that cloud that represents the what? The presence of God. And spake unto, unto him, and took the spirit that was upon him, took the spirit that was upon Moses, and gave it to the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. Now, Here's the thing to keep in mind, and, and, and um, the prophecy that came upon those 70 elders wasn't because they were uh, uh, totally following God. They were now in the office of where they had to say the things that came from God. That's the office they're in. They're part of the 70, and when they're in the office, God's going to use them. And you say, well, you know, what does that kind of mean? Well, it's kind of like how... Um, when Jesus was being crucified, a couple of things happened. Number one, one of the, 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 the Sanhedrin or the, the, the leaders said something, it's better for one to die for the multitude than for, the, than for all the people to die, which, a, which was a correct statement. That's what Jesus was going to do. He was going to die so that everybody else didn't have to die. He was speaking prophetically, although that's not what he meant. He was not meaning it as a thing for God. And the same thing when it came down to the high priest. The high priest had to put his hand on the, on the sacrifice. He had to lay his hand on the sacrifice. And so when he came to Jesus, the high priest came to Jesus, and he didn't lay his hand on him to bless him. He slapped him. So his purpose for putting his hand on Jesus was not for what he wanted it for, but because of the office he had, he still had to fulfill all the law. And so Jesus had to have that high priest's hand on his head, and it happened. But, but the high priest did what? Slapped him. But it's still fulfilled. And so you see here that they, these 70 are now prophesying. Don't make a mistake that they are now God's chosen people and you know of, 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 of leadership and, and guidance. They were just the heads of their tribe, and they're brought in. And because they're in the presence and in the office that God has allowed, they are prophesying. Okay, so you need to keep that in mind. All right, um, and, 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 and did not cease. All right, so, and that whole did not cease, meaning that it, it actually, it wasn't something that happened continuously. It was like a one-time thing. Look at 26. But there remained two of the men in the camp. So he was supposed to call out all 70. What this is telling us is that not every one of them came out to the, to the tabernacle of the congregation. There were two that were still in the camp, all right? But yet, they were still the elders, and God said that the elders would get the spirit put upon them. Let's see what happens, even though they weren't in the camp. Let's see what happens. And the name of, of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. Uh, and I could play around with those words, you know, that Eldad and Medad. I could play around with that. I do stuff like that, but I'm, I'm just going to say, say it like that. But it says a whole lot about, you know, them being, you know, who's the dad? The dad is supposed to be the what? The head or the leader or the guide. And so now they've taken on this so-called L dad. L is a word for God. And me is, you can look at it from a standpoint of just, you know, me. So who's God? Is God God? Is God dad? Or, is, or am, am I uh, dad? That's just me playing with the words. It probably don't mean anything. But you'd be surprised what the spirit of God does. The spirit of God don't waste anything. But anyway, so you got Eldad and Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. 
and they were of them that were written, uh, but when uh, but went not out unto the tabernacle. So they were part of it, but they didn't go out to the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. So they weren't at the tabernacle, but they were in the camp, and they began to prophesy right where they were, because that's what God said. Okay, twenty-seven. And there ran a young man unto Moses, saying, El dad and me dad do prophesy in the camp. So now, when they heard that, and, and Joshua heard that as well, and it says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of the young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. So he's saying, Don't let them prophesy, because they're not at the tabernacle of the congregation, but yet they're speaking for the things of God. It shows that God can do things not the way you always think it should, can be done. God's hand is not short. The math did not add up. They weren't at the tabernacle, so they shouldn't be prophesying. No, God can't break through all kinds of barriers. The Spirit of God went where it needed to go, even if you weren't where you needed to be. It's amazing sometimes when you think about that. 29. And Moses said unto him, uh, Envious thou uh, for my sake? In other words, are you, are you feeling bad that they're doing so-called my job? Well, number one, Moses didn't mind them doing his job because he said that his job was too heavy for him. So he said, are you envious uh, for my sake? Would it the God that all the Lord's people were prophets? So Moses was saying, I wish everybody could prophet. That way every, God could speak to everybody for themselves. So what Moses' desire here is, is actually what happened when Jesus became our, uh, uh, our sacrifice. And the tabernacle of congregation and the, uh, uh, the Holy of Holies and the veil that separated was no longer needed. And what happened? The veil was torn from the top to the bottom. And now scripture tells us we can go to God how? Boldly. We can go to him for ourselves. We don't have to wait till we get to the tabernacle of congregation. We don't have to go through the, uh, the priest. We don't have to bring no, no, no uh, burnt offerings and peace offerings. We just go to God because all the offerings have been offered permanently and all the offerings were all commonly or, 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 or consummated in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Everything was fulfilled. And so he goes on and says, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. So Moses was like, I don't have a problem with it. In other words, it's going to be something that happens anyway. Let's keep going. And Moses got uh, him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. So now they're, now they're all there. 31. And there went forth a wind from the Lord. Okay. Wind. What, do we know anything about wind? What is the, um, uh, the, the prophet uh, uh, um, Joel? He said, in the, the, in the last day, uh, I will pour out my spirit upon what? All flesh. That speaks about what Moses just wished, right? That all people would have it. And when did that happen? It happened at the day, on the day of what? Pentecost. And they were all, all together in one room, and suddenly there became a, a rush and mighty what? Wind. Wind. So you see how these two are tied together? The prophecy of Joel that, that Peter also recited that uh, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, which is what he did here. He poured his spirit upon, upon all the 70, but now in the day of Pentecost, he poured out his spirit upon all flesh. All right? And, uh, and it's interesting. The spirit came upon what? Flesh. Flesh. What are the people craving for here? They want flesh. flesh. But they want flesh for the natural. God's taking the spiritual and fill, fulfilling what the flesh really needs. The, the flesh doesn't need more flesh. The flesh needs spirit. And we have to always try to remember that. All right, but look at 31. Right here, they, they're going to get what they want. The flesh is about to get more flesh. Look what happens. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quail from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on on this side, <clears throat> and as it were a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, as it were about two cubits high upon the face of the earth. Okay, so 
Imagine how much quail. If you go and you walk, you okay, walk. Wait. Yes. I have a question. She yeah. wants to know what is quail. A quail is like a bird. That's what yeah, I know. Yeah, it's like a, like like a bird. All right, and so that, that that's the that's the. Uh, um, but it said came from the sea. That's probably why she. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but those are yeah. And so they uh, they're out there and they're getting these quail. Now imagine, there's quail. If you walk a whole day in the north, you walk and, and you're gonna still see quail on the ground. You walk a whole day to the south, you're still gonna see a quail. I don't care which way you walk for a whole day round about. All you're gonna see on the ground is what quail. Quail. And it's two cubits. No, no, it's like two between two to four feet uh, deep. That's a lot of flesh. All right, let's keep going. Though. Let's look what happened. All right, and, and verse 32. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quail. This is what they wanted because this is what they wanted with the manna. I want to gather as much manna as I want. Now, he's, now, when it comes to flesh, see, the Spirit of God, you're only going to get what you need. When it comes to flesh, you can take more than you need because the flesh only wants to gag and kill you anyway. So it won't proportion. It will let you satisfy all your lusts. You will get as much of it as you want. That's what flesh does. All right. And so and he gathered, uh, uh, he that gathered the least gathered 10 homers. In other words, they gathered like 20 gallons. And they spread it uh, all about uh, for themselves round about the camp. So they got the quail. They, they opened it up and they laid it out on the ground. They're making a whole bunch of quail Slim Jims. Just a whole bunch of, you know, they just drying the meat out. All right? So, so they can eat. <laughs> a whole bunch of quail jerky. Exactly. <laughs> and so, and, and they're just sitting there. And boy, they're, they're probably talking about, oh, God answered our prayer. Did the, this is not the time to rejoice. Even though you got what you think you wanted, you're still in a problem. You haven't learned yet. Look what happens. Verse 33. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, air in was chewing it. While they were, it was in their teeth while they were chewing it. The wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. All right? Lust will kill you. Eventually. Yes. It, will, it will take you out. You drink too much water, you will die. You eat too much food. Eat too much wheat or sugar or protein. You eat too much of anything, you will die. When you lust for anything, you go way over and above what you're supposed to do that thing will kill you. It don't matter what you're trying to do. Anything. Uh, when you got somebody that, oh, I love this person so much, I don't ever want them to leave my sight. That will kill you and the person that you, 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 you're stalking. So too much. You got to have what? Godly balance. And a lot of times you're not going to have it when you're lusting. 34. All right, so it was a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hat Tabash. All right, and so uh, they memorialized this place as well. There were two places now that they have where people's lusts have produced what? A memorial. A memorial of destruction. Right. First it was a burning, and now it's a great plague. Okay? And why? Because uh, uh, there they burnt the people that lust. They bur I'm sorry, they buried the people that lust. All right? So now, the people that lust were now what? Dead. Your lust will kill you. If you don't give it to the Lord. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. All right? And so 
we look at how this started. It started with complaining and wanting. And that's where all lust starts. It starts in the, in the heart and the desire and the mind. Just thinking about, oh, I remember back in Egypt. That's how all that stuff started. Lust operates by you thinking wrong. You're getting the wrong concept and keep feeding it over and over and over in your mind. And eventually, you're going to act on it. Right? You're going to act on it. You keep, you keep looking at that thing you ain't supposed to have. I don't care if it's a woman or a, or a man or, or a cookie or a potato chip. You don't care what you, you look at it long enough. You're going to go get it. You're going to go get it. Or try. That's it. You're going, you're going after it. All right? Because you keep, it keeps whirling in your mind. And that's why the scripture lets us know, don't be conformed to this world, but be what? Trans Transformed. Trans How? By the renewing of your mind. So you got to find ways to reprogram your mind. If you let your mind follow the dictates of this world, this world will get you into a, 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 a con continuous thought process that will feed your own desires, which will always equate to lust. Can we just want God? And some people, I want more than just God. Okay, well then be careful. Because when you get God or something else, then you don't really have God. Not the God of Isaac, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You got another God. See, that's where there's multiple gods. That's why God says He is the only God. He's the God of God. He's number one. There's only uh, only Him, and He's a jealous God. Because if you mix Him with anything else, you don't have Him. But that's why all these other cultures they always have multiple gods. We got a God for this. That's what they had in Egypt. They had a God for every particular circumstance and situation. They had a, a combination or a, a grouping of gods. Well, when you do that, you're going to bring forth the confusion and the, and the lust and, and, and all of that. You need to love God and leave your lusts behind. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised what God will do for you. You got to trust him, though, because he's going to bring you through stuff that you may not want to go through. And you would not have picked if you had to choose. But will you trust him? And that's the key. All right? I'm going this way, and I'm just going to have to trust God. I don't, and you may not like it, but are you trusting him? It may be uh, something that don't seem to be what you were hoping for, but will you trust him? That's the key. Let's read our last verse. And the people journeyed from Kibroth Hat Tyva to uh, Haziroth and abode in Haziroth. Now, uh, next week we're going to find out what's happening with Haziroth. Because it seems like, I, and, I, and I always like to play with words, because I'm like, there's going to be some kind of a hazard in Haziroth. And, That's right. And, and there is going to be. It's going to be a problem. And you know what? It's going to be a problem that we see even today. Mm -hmm. Same kind of problem. Mm -hmm. That this problem that we're going to see here is one that we are dealing with in our headlines today. That's just a, a, a trailer about uh, uh, next week, if the Lord say the same, when we gather together uh, on next Sunday. All right, we're going to stop here.